give it away. All right, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Lalamy. I own the Trusted Toolbox, and I've also started a new company called the Home Service Institute. But today, what I'm going to talk about is how customer service is sales. It's one of the things that we all talk about. We all know we want to do it. Is there anybody here who doesn't believe in good customer service? Raise your hand. Think it sucks? No. Right. So we're going to talk about that a, a little bit today, and I'm going to talk about how I ended up getting into the training business and how I did this. But it all started for me 14 years ago, but 10 years ago, I got a call from Veronica. Veronica says, I want to talk to the owner. Yes, here I am, Veronica. Hey, you're the one who did the estimate. I bought you because I believe in you and your company. But your guy who came out, he was a nice guy, but I just don't think he did it the way you did. I don't think he did the job that you said he was going to do. I don't think he cleaned up after himself like I think you would have expected. I don't think he charged me appropriately based on what you told me originally. He was a nice guy, and I don't want to get him in trouble, and I don't want you to fire him, but I think he didn't act like you. He wasn't really like you. And I think you need to come out here and take a look at this because I just don't think the quality is right. So I said, all right, Veronica, I'll come out. And more to come on Veronica and how I got into that situation. If you've ever gotten that call that says, he's a nice guy, but we all know what's coming. And if you've never gotten that call, congratulations, you're one of the best contractors I've ever met in my life. <laughs> so you guys are doing a great job. What I realized about my team 10 years ago is that I couldn't be on site. I have 15 technicians today. I have five project managers that run their remodeling site. I cannot be on my site every day. And if I can't be on my site every day, how do I get the guys to act like me? Well, what do I want them to do? Well, number one, I want to make money. I'm a business owner, right? I want to make profit. I want to make good money. I also know to make good money, I need to keep employees, my subcontractors, my project managers, I need to keep them with me because we know that long tenured employees or people who work with us makes our job easier, right? And when our job is easier, they're happier, they have a better time of what's going on, and we can get that raving five-star review, that fan that says, I can't wait to go out there and give you guys an awesome review and tell all of my friends. So this is what I want as an owner. And as I started to think about what Veronica said 10 years ago, I started to figure out what was going on. I have a want as an owner, and I want to make money, I want to have raving fans, and I'd love to keep my team together for years and years. But something was going on. So since then, I have realized a number of things. I have written a book called From the Zoo to the Wild, where I was able to reflect on what I did about training in my company. I've actually started a podcast to help other people like us. Called The Small Business Safari, thank you. Uh, but I realized 10 years ago, I really wasn't in the remodeling or the handyman business. I was really in the training business. I only got to see these guys every once in a while. I don't make my team come to the office and start with me every day. They go and dispatch from their house. Just like anybody of your project managers, your subs, you probably don't see them every day. If you're a one-man band, you can be on the job at your job site taking care of things this way. But I realized I only had an opportunity to start training people the way I wanted things to be done so they could do things for them. So here's my team back when the Veronica called. And I went, wow, what's going on? Why is my team not doing what I wanted to? I realized at the time, though, that my team is the face of my company. The person who shows up that day to do the transaction today, whatever it may be, plumbing, drywall, electrical, framing, whatever you're doing, today is the day they got to be the face of your company. So I wanted them, that crew right there, to look like me. <laughs> I wanted them to be as good as me. And frankly, I want them to be a lot better than me because they have the skills that I don't have. But I had to sit there and say, all right, what do I have? Well, I have a team. I have a team of electricians and plumbers and painters and drywall specialists and framers and carpenters. But what are they really? Who, is the, who are the people we're talking about today? Our subcontractors, our project managers, they really view themselves as artists. And if you think about that for a minute, they really are artists. I've said this a lot. I say this a lot on my podcast. If we truly believe the blue collar world we're in, truly we are artists. We're artists like sculptors. We're artists like pianists. We're artists like portrait painters. What do artists think? Artists think they're very good at what they want to do, right? what they do. They also want to be rewarded for what they do. They want to say, wow, you did a great job finishing off my house. When somebody paints a portrait, they want the payment, but they also want the accolades, right? So they are the smartest people in the room. They are skilled artisans. What's the other problem we have in our business? Well, we have customers. The next business I start will not have employees or customers. I'm still looking for that one magic bullet. But here are our customers. 
So we have our artists who are going to go out there and make beautiful things happen and leave a legacy in a home. Leaving a legacy in a home, that's really what we're doing, right? If you think about what we're doing, we're doing things that they can't do. But we run into these customers. We run into Harry Heater, who the minute you show up is on guard and on point and ready to blast you for any little thing you do wrong. Sometimes you get, Irene, I don't know. You're the expert. You tell me what's supposed to happen. I think this job's supposed to all be done today, right? So let's do that. All right, I don't know. I'm not sure. Here's our favorite. We call her Felicia Fingers. <laughs> the minute it happens, she's letting us know we're number one. But we had to cover those fingers up. The last one is, I'm from the Show Me State, and they call me Scott. You show me that you're supposed to be doing what you're doing. I'm going to sit here with my arms crossed. I'm going to let you know if you're doing a good job by whether or not I talk to you. So those are our customers. And at the Trusted Toolbox, sometimes we got to make light of them. we got to have some fun with them because sometimes they can put you under a lot of pressure. Just was in the bathroom, coming out of the bathroom, guy says, I've already fixed four fires this morning. Thank God I had my phone with me. What are fires like? Why? Right? That's Harry Heater. That's Irene I don't know. That's Felicia Fingers. That's Scott Show Me. These are the people saying, what the heck's going on here? And if you don't take a step back, there's a reason I got into construction because you don't want me flying your airplane, you don't want me working on your heart, and definitely nowhere near your brain, because you don't want me doing any of that. But I know that what we're doing, the odds are nobody's dying. So we can get this fixed, and if you lower the anxiety level of your team, you can go out there and solve that customer's problem. Because what we want to have are those raving fans, that busy family of four, because we all know, right, when you do a great job, they tell everybody. No, they tell nobody, unless you ask them. <laughs> You do one bad job, and you can guarantee you they're telling 10. But we want raving fans who are referring their friends, their family, their neighbors. One of the things I'm proudest of at the Trusted Toolbox is that 60% of our business comes from 40% repeat business. The other 20% is referred by satisfied customers. So we're very proud of the fact that we do this, but it's still a challenge. And why is understanding that you have artists that are going out every day and working with customers who probably don't know what to expect this is where we got to start working on it. So where does the training happen? Well, I'm going to let you into my secret club. Here's the secret that you need to know about each and every customer. In the world of HGTV, in the world of internets, in the world of YouTube, everything's done in three to five minutes, and I should have a beautiful bathroom kitchen or a beautiful outdoor deck all done in 30 minutes before the next commercial comes on. Right? So they think the job is already done when you get there. And now that I've let you into that club, I let my artists into that club. And that's what, one of the things we need to talk about. We have artists who just want to do a great job. They just want to show off their artistry and have somebody just say, man, you did a great job when you walked away when they get to go home that night. But what we train on is we let them know that the customers, when you get there, they think that's already done. Whoa, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it does. And if we remember Willy Wonka and the girl with the squirrel, I want it now, Daddy. They all want it now. So when we realize that customers, when they're coming into the house, want it done now, watch HGTV, look at YouTube, and see all this stuff being done just like that. They don't have the realistic expectation yet. So I've been part of a number of studies over the years, and here's what we've learned. One of the things we've learned is that customers really don't want us to come in their house because they're worried about what? Well, they're worried that we're gonna come in and make a mess. And for all of us who are in construction, you realize that a lot of times, especially when you're working in somebody's house, deconstruction has to happen first. And what comes with deconstruction? A mess. So we know there's going to be a mess. They're also worried about us coming in their house because they think we're going to make a mistake. We think we're going to flood their house. We think that we're going to have their whole house fall down. We think that we're going to absolutely ruin their entire world. So they're afraid to have you. So when they finally decide to do it, they're going to think you're showing up. And the first day you show up and you got through your sale and you're starting to do your work and we all take down payments because we're... we're uh, we're all good remodelers who do things the right way, and you ask for that upfront money, guess what they're thinking? You're going to take my money and run. Well, not us, because we're all sitting in here trying to further ourselves and get, get our CEUs up so we can all get certified and be contractors again. But they're all thinking that anyway. And so when you're in that club and you understand that, now you can start lining yourself up for how you should train your technicians when they go out there or your project managers, whoever's going to be the face of your company. So as you're training those guys that you're talking about, and you bring them together and start talking about training, and we'll get to that on how to do effective training, you need to understand what these guys want. What's your team want? Well, it's pretty simple. I came from the white collar world, the white collar world of banking and consulting. You did not get genuine actors every single day working with you. 
you actually had people who had agendas. It might have sounded a lot like politics. They might have said they wanted one thing, but they really were angling for something else. Here's the beautiful thing about the business we're all in. We're with blue collar people. It's pretty easy. When they say they want to make more money, what do they want? They want to make more money. There's no hidden agenda. There's no anything else going on. When they tell you, I'm not working today because I got a headache, they didn't feel like working. Let's face it. So we know what we got, but we know that these guys want to make money. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because when you're talking about training, you've got to explain to them why this is going to help them demonstrate their skills to eventually show off how good they are so they can go home and have an easy transaction. Because when they go home at night, they aren't thinking about invoicing and billing and tomorrow's job and the other things we've got to do as owners and project managers and all doing all that stuff that we have to do to get ready for the job. They get to relax, recharge, and get ready to go back at it tomorrow. Because if you don't make it easy for them, they don't get to show off their skills. They don't feel like they're getting rewarded. And remember, they still need to make money. And I put that, but they really want to demonstrate their skills. He was a nice guy, but Chris, I just think you need to come out here and take a look. And I went out there and took a look at Veronica's job. It was close. It wasn't horrific. It could have all been punched out in probably 30 minutes. It took me an hour because we had to talk. But here's what happened when Veronica said, he was a nice guy, but I think you need to come out here and take a look. I went out and took a look. And we walked around. And she said, well, see, that just wasn't done. And he didn't clean the drywall off the baseboard in the other room that he was supposed to do. And there's one piece of brick mold that he missed on the right side of the house. And I'm like, you know what? I didn't put that on the work order. That's my fault. Let me get that fixed. But she said, but if you have a minute, can I tell you really what happened? Please, Veronica, tell me. Why was she mad? Here's why she was really mad. She had an appointment to play tennis. Does anybody know what Alta is? Alta on Thursday mornings, Alta on Thursday mornings right now, if you are not showing up on time, you're ruining not just one lady's day, you're ruining five ladies' day, you are ruining their entire team's day, and you have ruined their team. So she couldn't go play Alta, she had to find a sub, and it ruined her day. So she was mad. She was anxious, and she was, let's face it, she was pissed. My guy got there, what's the first thing he does? Well. Chris, I realized that he couldn't have everything, but he went right away to go shopping for materials. He went to Home Depot, and I think he was gone for like three hours. I'm like, okay, yep, I understand. And then the kids were getting off the bus at three o'clock in the afternoon. He was still here. And I was starting to make dinner, and my husband came home at five, and he was still here. And he had to come back and finish the next day. So what I learned is that that small problem that happened in the beginning really fell to pieces when I wasn't training my guys on what to do. So the easy answers are, and I'll show you some of this with the training that we do today, call your customers before you go. Give them a plan when you get there. Get something done before you get going anywhere. Do not immediately go get materials. Give them the plan, communicate with them. If we would have done all that, things would have changed. Because she said, if I just would have had a call and let me know that he was coming later, I would have gone off and played tennis and then I would have come back and I would have checked on him which no, she would not have done that. But Veronica did let me know this. So I learned a lot about this, is that a lot of times they're saying, I'm afraid you're gonna make a mess, I think you're gonna make a big mistake, and I don't want your artists in my house because I think my service is gonna look like this, and I bet you're gonna take my money and you aren't gonna do a good job. So I want you to turn my service from this into this. They expect us all to look like this when we show up at a house. They all expect us to do that when we're demoing a bathroom, or you're, laying, you're putting drywall in, up above your head. I don't want any drywall dust on me because, well, I, I don't get any on me. I'm, I'm a perfect drywaller. No, of course not. So we know we're going to deconstruct and we're going to be messy, but what they're expecting in their head, these customers, is they're expecting that great service. So what do I have? I have an owner who wants to make money, who thinks he's got a great business, who thinks he's doing great things and doing everything the way he's supposed to be doing. I got a, I got a tech who's saying, just let me do my job, man, because if you just let me do my job and I get to show off how great I am, they're going to love me. But I got a customer over there, hands clenched, going, if you have a minute, I'm really worried that you're going to really screw my house up. Well, OK, so what are we doing? Well, we're pulling that lever. We're trying to get these guys to get all lined up. And I can't get it to work, so we'll just go it. But I want all smiles across the board. One of the things we also need to understand in training is why do they pick us? Why do they pick us as a company? Well, here's some pretty cool things. This is part of another study I was part of. They want to see you have a reputation. 
Now your reputation could be because your neighbor said so. Your reputation could be your church group said so. Your reputation could be a face group group said so. But for us sitting here getting CEUs and getting credits, we think our established reputation is our website, our Google reviews, and everything that makes us different, makes us unique in the marketplace. So they want to know that you have an established reputation, however big or small it is. They also want to know that you're going to guarantee your work. So we know that they want you to guarantee your work. If you don't have a warranty in place now and you're not presenting that in the business you're in, that's something you're going to want to probably do. And why, why is that important for customer service is sales? Because when you're training your team, you're saying, guys, I'm not just sending you out there for today. I'm sending you out here because I'm warranting this work for a year. I was just in the deck training class before this. I'm not going to put a deck up that's going to fall down in a couple of years. I'm going to put a deck up that's going to last the way it's supposed to last because we're going to warranty and we're going to guarantee our work. And here's the other one, it's a shocker. We actually return messages. We actually communicate with customers. And communication sets us apart from a lot of others. We've all heard it, right? You've showed up to do an appointment. How many times have they just said, huh, I'm so glad at least you showed up because I can't get anybody to come out here. And you're like, oh great, I'm gonna win this job. <laughs> I'm all set, at least I showed up. Then they wanna hear that. So that's what they're looking for. Now here's another part of the study. What makes those customers that you may have sold or your, your salesperson sold, what makes them believe that the technician who's showing up, the project manager who starts the job or the subcontractor is going to do it, what's going to make them feel comfortable with the person coming to their house? It's that they call ahead of schedule. It's that they call 30 minutes ahead of the intended appointment time. Consistency of doing that is a hallmark. And we're going to talk about why training is so important because building that habit across everybody subcontractors, project managers, maybe somebody in the office calling ahead. They want to know when the artist shows up that they know what they're doing. They want to know that the person showed up today was the right, job, right person, right job, and they're here on time. And if that person can communicate what they're doing and demonstrate some skills on what they're doing, they'll start to lower their anxiety level and start to wash away some of the anxiety that they had. And lastly, they expect us to be neat and professional. They all have seen the bratty pickup truck pulling up with the back gate probably not on it, with a spare tire that's wobbling, with paint all over. And sometimes they'll forgive us and they will forgive us in our world because they'll say, well, you know, it is construction, that's what we do. But more and more, if you want to set yourself apart and make yourself unique, your team should be showing up because they are going to hit you on neat and professional. If they clean up and get everything taken care of, they're going to be great, I did it. But showing and demonstrating neat and professionalism, why do my artists care about that? Well, let's talk about something that we all have in common. Everybody in this room who does anything with construction has to plan. You gotta start the job, you gotta do the job, and you gotta finish the job, right? All four, we have to do all four of those. So what we're gonna start doing is we're gonna talk about the habits that we need to develop within our team and our company to get those four aspects taken care of from a customer service perspective. And one of the things we've talked about, and I'm going to get to it, is why is training so important? And it just doesn't happen once because Aristotle said it best. We are what we repeatedly do. This morning we all got up, we all showered, we all put clothes on, we all got in our car, and we all came here. That's a habit. It was a habit that said, I have to be here by 8 o'clock. That's a success habit. Just showing up. Just showing up. So if Aristotle said that, why aren't we proactively training? And if today you're doing training, great. But what we're doing in training is we're developing that habit, that muscle memory, right? We're developing those habits that they have. So if they can work a screw gun the right way, if they know how to cut framing lumber, if they know how to do crown molding really well because they do it all the time, that's one thing. That's a habit. That's a skill they have. But customer service is also one. So we realized that training continually, continuously and having a cadence on what we're doing was good. Well, I was doing training after Veronica said that, and I thought I was doing really well with it. Then I started realizing I was having some of those, he was a nice guy butts. So I started to really look at my training. What the heck was I doing wrong? And I wasn't real happy with myself because I felt like I was pretty good at this. So what I found out was effective training has three components for the artists that we're talking about to handle the customers that we all deal with. Number one, we're going to talk about our company culture. We're going to talk about who we are, what makes us different, and they're going to listen to that. But if you just do that, 
Ladies and gentlemen, that's blah, 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 BS, BS, BS. I don't want to hear that stuff. So the next thing we do is we start talking about operations. This is the process that we have. This is what we expect from you. We expect you to call your customer when you show up. We expect you to give the plan when you get there. Blah, blah, blah. Tell me something else. I got to get out there and get to work. So what we found is the last thing is the most important. What can make their life easier? What new tool, new trick, new tip, maybe a new product that's out there, something that makes their life easier, they start buying into the customer service and the operational processes. And when I was able to start tying all that back and saying, look, if you do those two, first two things I just asked you to do, I'm gonna show you a new tool or new trick on this, they started to realize they could start making more money. They could start having an easier transaction. They could start demonstrating the skills they wanna do. So we started to translate that back and we started to get the team buying into it. So what do we talk about with our company culture? Well, we talked about who we are and why we do this. At the Trusted Toolbox, we have a thing called the mission plaque. Because I know mission statements doesn't mean anything to anybody unless you're the CEO who came up with it at your company. So we translated that into the mission plaque and we put that up front and center every time we talk and we talk about our five principles of our company. We talk about setting people up for success. That's my first component. But again, if I just did that, Oh my God, he's making me come in for training again and all he's gonna tell me to do is call my customers. I'm getting sick hearing this stuff. So what do we also talk about? Well, things that are important to them. Because we said they gotta make money, they gotta demonstrate their skills and they gotta have an easy transaction. They also wanna have time off. Well, how do they get time off in your company? Well, we show them how you can make, get time off. We show them how to clock in and clock out. And we tell them that hey, you don't know how to clock in, you don't know how to clock out. Guess what I don't know how to do? I don't know how to pay you. And if I can't pay you, you're not going to like me. So if you do these things, I can pay you and you're going to like me. Okay, maybe I'll clock in and clock out now. So we talk about that. But lastly, and most importantly, we talk about this. We talk about deck code changes. We'll talk about how to do a better job, either rebuilding a toilet tank or putting in a garbage disposal, or we'll show them new tools that came out, or we'll have the 25 year in the business carpenter that's on our staff, who is the best and the wizard at all crown molding and all things bookcase, show off better ways to do these things because he is efficient and he's shown some of our more junior people how to do things better. And those guys started to buy into this, into the cadence. Because you made my job easier, I'm willing to come listen to you guys for training. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to take my want as an owner to make money, keep employees, have five-star reviews and line it up with their needs to make money and also have an easy transaction and demonstrate their skill sets. Now, today, show of hands, how many people have consistent training in their company? Hands high. Good, you're ahead of the curve, right? You're doing consistent training. You're showing that cadence and you're showing a commitment to do it. But if you're not doing it, just like I thought I was doing it in the beginning, I went, if they would have said that to me in a meeting 10 years ago after Veronica, I'd be like, yeah, I'm in for training because I want to make money, have five-star reviews, and keep employees. Well, yeah, but man, I just, I just don't think my team's going to like this. My 25-year veteran carpenter who's been working with me now for seven years, I knew he hated it. He didn't want to come and sit in here and listen to me. These guys are artists. There's a reason they're not here doing this today. They don't want to. They want to be out there showing people how great they are. They want to be working with their hands and be able to show something for what they did today. So he didn't want to come and listen to me. He's going to hate it. And I was like, you know, actually, Trusted Toolbox has a really good reputation. We're pretty good. I'm showing up. Oh, I'm so glad you guys showed up. Hey, we're getting, we're doing, and we're growing. I'm doing great. My metrics are good. But really, it came down to, man, I don't have time to do all this training. I don't have time. I know they're going to hate it, but I think I'm doing all right. Well, I told you about Aristotle and habits. Habits build culture. And whether you know it or not, everybody in here who owns a company or is part of a company, you have a culture. And you have to understand what that is. Where is your culture at? Is it one of inclusiveness and teamwork and customer first and making things happen and being problem solvers and being face of the company and being artists that they're doing it? Or is it one where, yeah, if I show up and clock in and clock out, yeah, I get paid. You have to think about that because this builds your culture in your company just by having consistent training. So I told you about my company and why I did it. And now I look back on it now, it's been, we've been doing consistent training now for over five years, but I took these metrics now right before COVID. When I first got started, my reviews on Google were 
But I told you, I thought my metrics were good. Well, I have an excuse. I was on kudzu. I was great on kudzu, but they got rid of kudzu. And freaking kudzu killed me. But Google, I was on 4.1. Well, so I started doing this training. And it doesn't happen overnight. We do training twice a month or every other Wednesday. And I'll show that in a minute about how you can implement training like this as well in your own company. We got to 4.6 and we're still holding at 4.6 now with over 540 Google reviews. When we first started, I only had 50 Google reviews. So now we're up to 540. So that's pretty impressive. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's good. What else did I want? I said I needed to keep text with me, right? My handyman were staying with me for about seven months. And when I talked to other handyman around in the nation, people who own franchises, people who had handyman companies in Austin, Texas, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, and New York, seven months, you're like, Phew, that's about right. That's what you should expect. I'm like, huh? Oh, well, that's what I should expect. Now that I've done this, my average tenure is over two years. My guys are staying with me longer. And who doesn't want guys who are good staying with you longer? Because they're starting to buy into what we're talking about and what we're doing. But in the beginning, it was, oh God, here we go again. Chris is gonna tell me, call my customer, give him a plan, tell him what to do, customers are important, whatever. Now they're like, hey, I kind of like what we're doing because I'm gonna show you some aspects of the training that we're doing. I told you my metrics were good, right? My handymen don't like to sell. And we don't want them to sell, we want them to do. We want them to be artists. But if they work and they do things right with the right attitude, sometimes customers come up and do what? Gosh, I'm so glad you're here. Can you fix this too? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Can you do this? I went from almost zero dollars of uh, add-on sales to now it's almost 10% of our overall revenue. And these guys don't want to be selling. They can't sell. They think sales is a bad word. The minute I say, hey man, you guys got to sell, all they're thinking is used car salesman, get me out of here, I'm an artist. My work should stand for itself. Don't make me sell. But I got that. Here's the other thing I was worried about in training. I bring these guys in every other Wednesday or twice a month for one hour. I was worried that my tech utilization would go down because, right, we want to get them all out in the field. I want them out there working. If I'm going to take them out of the field, I'm going to lose my utilization. My utilization went up almost 10%. And if you are a good running company, and I know Lair Homes does a great job with utilization because I talked to David Michelson about this, utilization is a hallmark of a well-run, efficient company. Now we're doing 94% showing me that this training works. So let's talk about why I was in the training business. And let's talk about now how you can implement some of this too. So get a training plan in place. So how do you do it? Let's get into it. One, these guys do not want to sit here and listen to be drone on and on like you guys are listening to me look drone on and on and on. They would be bored out of their mind if they had to come sit here all day. They would be fidgety, they'd be out of here. So leave it at one hour. Make it a one hour really crisp meeting. And what we also know about home services and everything we do, don't do it on Monday, because Monday is what? Hell. That's right. And that's why I'm glad Monday's always over. As they say, nobody wants to stop in hell. You always want to go through hell, because you don't want to stay in there. So Mondays are hell. Fridays, I don't train, because then they have all weekend to forget about it. So we do Tuesday, Wednesdays, or Thursdays. We start at 7.30 in the morning. We do it twice a month. If you do it every week, it starts to get a little too repetitive. It starts to feel as if you're overlording. If you're doing it once a week, congratulations, you've overcome that in your own culture. But if you're only doing it monthly, you're missing a great opportunity to reinforce that, that habit and that culture because you can't train these guys in every single aspect of those four areas that we all have to work on, planning, starting, doing, and finishing a job. You can't do it every single time. You gotta pick one. So we found that, that works. Here's the other thing I know. Pick the music up, pick the environment up, pick the energy up. So when we come in at 7.30 in the morning, we're pumping things on our, our TV, we're pumping out videos of work we did with some cool pumping music to kind of get it up. We also feed them. <laughs> Chick-fil-A biscuits are the winner. Dunkin' Donuts became the loser. So we get Chick-fil-A biscuits. Everybody looks forward to that as well. But we get them in there and they're getting ready to listen. But what we found is that my owner wants of getting my company culture, my owner wants of getting them to understand my operations aligned with their needs to make my job easier, I needed to tell it a little bit differently. And I needed to also celebrate some of the things we do. I needed to celebrate our successes, anniversaries, birthdays. If you've ever won an award, raise your hand if you won a National Cody Award. A National Cody Award. For those who don't know what it is, a lot of us don't, right? The contractor of the Year. These guys went to the national competition and won an award. Now, raise your hand if you went back and celebrated all that with your team. Great, 
That's what we need to be doing. So celebrating an award, what does that tell your team? Hey, I was part of something bigger. I was part of something that made some, a difference and somebody appreciated my art. So celebrating these things. The other thing I do know about my artists that are in the room is they're competitive. They're still the best artists in the room. If you're a project manager working for a company, you, by God, you're the best project manager that company's ever had, and that owner is so lucky to have you. Right, Naveed? That's right. That's right. So we know that. These guys are competitive. So have some contests. Have some fun with it. Keep the energy up. Keep it going, and that's important. Here's our environment here at the Trusted Toolbox. And if you can see it all the way in the back, there's three pictures. The things I want you to pick up, the colors. It's yellow and red. Yeah, that's the company colors that we have. But you'll see they're bright and vibrant. You'll see that we have bright lights. We added some extra lights. You also see on the wall, every time they come into training, it says who we are and what we do. Who we are and what we do every single time you come in that room. When you face up and you look at Chris or the operations manager or somebody I brought in for training, you're always gonna see our mission plaque. And on the other wall, they're gonna see themselves. Our team is on our wall every time they walk in that room. And when they're on that wall, what do they see? I'm part of something bigger. And on that wall, it says their first name and it says how long they've been here. On the, next to that wall is how they can get bonuses, how they can prove to other guys that they did more that month. They had more add-ons. They got the most reviews because we post all of our reviews for that month up there on that board. So they get to see the benefits of the stuff that I see in the office because I can't see them every single, in, every single day on what they're doing. So I started like that. You're like, oh man, I don't have that. Well, I didn't either. So when I first started, I had an easel. And I had a little conference room, the guy I was subleasing from. And I'd shove them all in the conference room. And I didn't have thumping music and beautiful bright lights. I just had an easel. Then I eventually went and bought a $100 Walmart stand and a monitor. And I started doing that. So it started to build the habit. And I realized I was in the training business, which brought me to the Home Service Institute. So how can you effectively train within that one hour to do what we got to do? So I told you there's four components. We got to prep, start, do, and then we have to finish. Well, at the Home Service Institute, what we've done is we've told stories in each one of those areas. And we tell stories that will speak to these guys in the mindset of which they want to be talked to. Because what we know is that we got to play to your audience. They are not going to sit here and do rote math. Two plus two is four. Four plus four is eight. Eight plus eight is 16. Chris, get me the hell out of this training class now. Right? They won't do that. But what they will do as artists is they'll listen to a story. How often have you heard stories carry the day? If any of us here are in sales, and if you own your own business, of course you're in sales. And if you're a project manager, of course you're in sales. And if you're a technician sitting in here, you're in sales. Stories carry the day. So we realized that stories were more important to get our message across. So we tell stories. We tell a story with just one point in it, or maybe three little sub points. And we make the point in the story, and then we have our operations manager or me come up after and reinforce the three points that we talked about in our customer service module. Remember, we're doing three things. I'm just talking about today the customer service piece. You know your operations, and you know how to go make their jobs easier with the areas that you work in. But in the customer service piece, we know this is the story. So let me give you some examples of what we do. Okay. My tech is awesome. My project manager is awesome. Chris, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to call the customer. You've already told them they're coming. Well, Jill in the office told them I'm coming, so I don't need to contact them. None of those people are the face of the company that day. Not Chris, not Jill. It's going to be them. So when they say, I don't need to call my customer, I'm like, guys, guys, you got to call your customer. Come on, please. So we say, you know what? We're going to tell a story. So in this story, what we talk about is a story about how how you land a plane on an aircraft carrier. Who doesn't think that's cool, right? Everybody thinks that's cool. When you see a jet land on an aircraft carrier, that is just flipping cool. So we tell a story of that. And you know everybody in that room is thinking, that's right, I'm the pilot. I'm Tom Cruise and I am Top Gun. I don't know what you all are doing, but I'm making it happen. So I don't know how you're helping me. So when we tell the story about how you do this, we tell them the story is, you have an air traffic controller. He's the commander on the ship. He's the one who's actually lining up the planes and the jets in formation to get it going. You have flight landing crews. You have two sets of crews. You have top deck and below deck. And those crews gotta be ready. And at the end, when the commander says, call the ball, the pilot 
has taken command of landing that jet on that aircraft carrier. Up until that point, he has not had control. He has control when he calls the ball. So we tell the story about calling the ball, and we say, guys, you are Tom Cruise. Call the ball. Let your dispatcher know you got this. Let your customer know you got this. Call your customers. So I went from blah, 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 guys, please call your customers. We tell this story. Guess who started calling their customers? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise called their customer. Because they all walked out of there going, I've got this. I'm going to call my customer. So we told that story, and we said, guys, this is why it's so important. So when the dispatcher knows that you were scheduled to go there, and the guy who sold the job knows you were scheduled to go there, and the customer now knows that you're the guy who's going to take over for them, and you're going to land that jet and make it happen, that's you. And they walk out of there, and they start calling their customers. So we do that once. And then we'll hit something else, because that's just getting ready. So let's talk about the next one. First, do I really need to talk to the customer when I get there? How many times have you told your subcontractor, do not talk to the customer, walk around the side of the house, don't make eye contact, don't even let them know you're there? Perfect. Great job. And if you're doing that, you might want to rethink it. Because you've got to be thinking about who you got. Because I don't want them to know I'm there. So why do I have to tell them what I'm doing? Because they know why I'm there. Well, we tell the story about Amelia Earhart. Everybody here probably knows Amelia Earhart because she's the one who went missing. But if you really understood the story, we tell the story of Amelia Earhart got not only people to buy into her plan and her vision of helping women become equal with men, get them to be more important and come up. That was her plan. And you start talking about what she did. She actually got the President of the United States to back her mission to fly across the world. So we talk about Amelia Earhart got every, um, everybody on board, including the President of the United States, to help uplift women. Well, that's pretty powerful too, right? That's not a bad story. Well, why should I give somebody a plan? Because who knows, you might be working for the President of the United States one day in their house. You might want to tell them what you're going to do. Because remember the secret of the customer. They think in three minutes at the next commercial break, everything's going to be magically done. They think in 30 minutes, max, your whole bathroom's going to be finished. Okay, I'll give you a day, and you can get my kitchen done. So we tell them, you got to give them the plan, because if we don't set that expectation, you can't exceed that expectation. And if you get to take just three to five minutes and tell the customer what you're going to do today and what your plan is, guess what they're going to do? They're going to leave you alone. They're going to let you handle it until you do something wrong. But they let you do your thing. And if you want to show off what you've done at the end of the day, you get to show off what you're doing. So give them your plan. How come you didn't finish the job the way you're supposed to? Well, I showed up, man, and let's face it, you kind of sent me to a rat hole. It really wasn't the best looking house, so I didn't feel like I had to do my best job that day. I'm not saying you have to sacrifice quality, but what we talk about a lot is there are different hot buttons for every customer. Some people might not know what a good crown molding exterior miter looks like. How about an exterior crown mold miter joint with stain? Even tougher to hit. Right? They might not know what that quality is, but they might be really worried that you didn't put a drop cloth down over their brand new hardwoods that you're working over. They might be really worried is that when you finish the deck, you left a couple of screws or nails or wood that their dogs could run over and hurt their foot. You could have built the best deck in the world, but if you didn't clean up, they're like, what the heck? So what we do is we talk about this story. Instead of me just saying that, we talk about a story. This is, the story, this is the story of just two portraits of women. These are artists who painted two portraits of women. At the end of the day, they were both paid to paint a picture. One's called the Mona Lisa, one's called the Dormar, two very famous artists. But they're just portraits of women. Now the question I'll ask everybody is, which one would you put in your house? Money, no object. I've had a few people say none, but if I say you have to pick one, what I've found is that everybody picks about 50-50 down the middle. Can't believe that somebody put the Mona Lisa in my house. That thing's old, stodgy, that's not me. I'm cool, I'm hip, I'm Dormar. Other people are like, Dormar? Is that even a picture of a woman? Quality is in the eye of the beholder. So we tell that story and then we tell the guys, when you're there, you need to understand what the hot buttons or the quality is for this customer in the eye of the beholder. So we'll tell that story. Now they're asking those questions. Those questions you would ask in sales that they now know to learn to ask. All right, I finished my job, Chris. I just, can I slink out of there as quick as possible? Man, I gotta get going. Man, I don't really wanna to talk to the customer because they're probably gonna tell me I missed something. Let me tell you a story that we tell everybody here in this one, and I love this one. Maria was in Seattle. Maria is a uh, house cleaner in Seattle. 
Maria was known for having impeccable quality and a repeat customer base. As she went to expand her business and went from one crew to three crews, she started to get the, hey Maria, your team was nice, but they just weren't you. The house wasn't as clean as when you came. So Maria would go check the house quality and the cleanliness and see what happened. She would say, well, it's not that bad, but what's going on? And then Maria realized how she was finishing her jobs. We call it the chocolate chip cookie experience. So what she would do is she would take chocolate chip cookie dough, put the oven on two hours before she's finishing, stick the chocolate chip cookie dough in the oven, bake chocolate chip cookies and leave them on the countertop for the family to come home to. Who doesn't want to smell chocolate chip cookies when you walk in the house? Especially when you're on a diet, it's even harder. But you all do and it all evokes a great emotion. So she finished with a flourish. She left them with a chocolate chip cookie experience. All she had to do was tell her teams, take some chocolate chip cookie dough with you, bake them in the oven, stick them on the counter, things started to happen. So we tell our guys to bake chocolate chip cookies, put it, no, I don't do that. <laughs> I want my drywall guys to walk upstairs and get in their kitchen and start rooting around in their kitchen, no. But what we talk about is if you don't leave them with a lasting legacy impression of what you've done, they won't sit there and look at your work with a different view. Because remember what I said, we all love stories. And they all, the customers all want to be part of that story too. And if their story ends with a chocolate chip cookie finish, they go, wow, that thing looks beautiful. That kitchen, that bathroom. How about just my hot water works now? I don't know if we have any plumbers in here, but how many times has a customer come up and slapped a plumber on the back and said, thank God I got hot water. Because if my wife went one more day without hot water, I was dead. Leave them with a chocolate chip cookie finish. So we developed a number of these modules at the Home Service Institute where we tell the stories to help other companies get this going. So you see we have all different kinds of stories. Whether you use us or don't use us, I don't care. Tell a story to your artists to get them lined up because that's what's gonna happen. And so how much more time do we have? Perfect. Where are we coming with this? Training builds habits. If you do consistent training, you'll build habits. If you're like, ah, Chris, you know, great presentation. Hey, eh, you might even be kind of funny. At least your hands are flapping around a lot. Definitely are Italian, aren't you? If you don't say, ah, I don't know how to do it, you will be reactively training. You're gonna get that nice guy butt. You might not even get that. You might get the arms crossed. Show me Scott says, I have no more time for you. I'm gonna go find somebody else. You're losing customers every day if you're not doing this. If you're not doing this, you're losing techs you're losing project managers, you're losing team. And if you're losing these guys, you're creating a culture. And whether you know it or not, you have a culture. So you know that this habit has to be consistently done over and over and demonstrated. You have to lead by example, you have to put this in place, and you need to commit to this to make it happen. So tell a story, get them involved, because your habits equal your culture, and your culture will yield the outcomes. It's either a successful outcome or negative outcome. And so that's why I believe in training so much that I had to miss a training once and the entire group was wondering where the hell I was. They're like, I cannot believe Chris is missing training. And I was just down and out, bad cold, couldn't do it. I was gonna drag myself there, but I didn't wanna get them sick. But they realized how important it is for me. And they also are starting to buy in. Instead of having that dumpster talk, that water cooler talk about how bad things are, the conversation and the culture is now about, hey, I'm gonna go out there, I gotta get going, I gotta get to my job, I'm gonna go make things happen. I see it happen. Because at the end of this, all the training, what do we all want? As owners, we wanna make more money, keep employees and technicians and subcontractors with us longer, and we wanna have five-star raving fans. But I know the needs of the people I'm training are different than my wants. And if I can train and use my story, and my habits can develop the outcomes that we want, then my culture becomes one of inclusiveness, competitiveness, of customer first, and teamwork. So I would say commit to train. Build the cadence. Use three areas every time. We all want to do customer service. We all want to train them on operations. We want to train them on our new technology that we've got. But don't forget, making their job easier will go a long way to making the other two things cemented in. And finally, here's one. If it's worth it, this is what it's worth it for. Because I sat back and went, yeah, well, I'll just turn on pay-per-click. I'll get more customers. Well, I might be losing customers, but yeah, I can get more. You know, I'm going to advertise more for them. I'm going to do it. Studies show us this. It costs $1 to keep a customer. It costs $5 to acquire a customer. 
So I said in the beginning, 40% of our business came from repeat customers. The next 20 came from satisfied customers. The next 20 comes from referred from other contractors to us based on our reputation. I'm doing all of my advertising for 20% of what I'm bringing in. So that's the part where you go, well, that's kind of dumb, Chris. Yeah, it is. Trust me, it is. I make a lot of mistakes, but that's not what we're here for, to talk about that. I can tell you that who you've got, and if you want to keep repeat customers, you want to continually build that cadence with them. You build your cadence with your customers by building your cadence with your employees, your technicians, and your subcontractor. And the consistency will deliver it. So with that, I wanted to leave enough time for Q&A because I told you and came in and I told you about training. And I trained around my pain points and pain points I've seen from other companies around the nation. But I'd like to hear some of your pain points or if you guys got questions for me. First of all, um, thank you very much. I've, I've known you for a few years and watched your success. So, so proud of you for what you've accomplished so far. Seriously, Thanks. Um, for your business. And, um, but more importantly, I know you're not supposed to advertise your business, but I'm asking you to tell me or us about how you can train our businesses, we can come to you and, and, and put our people under your training. Okay, so I am gonna sell a little bit. Here we can do it two ways. Yeah, he asked so I can do that, right? Yeah. Right, we're off the clock. Me who loves to train, I have no objections to this. So two things we can do. Um, my general manager of the Home Service Institute will help you lay out a plan. Lay out a year plan, it's 24 modules, that's twice a month, helps you lay out the plan of hitting whatever your number one pain points are and then working our way through the rest of the pain points. And so we, we charge 1500 to set up the training and get it going and then you have access to the modules and then we can either do it at your place or we'll be willing to, especially in Atlanta, open up our place on any day other than Wednesday and do it in our place. But what we talked about doing, especially here in Atlanta is when I came here is I got to do a give back to Neri, so how could I do that? I'd be willing to do it at our place for your company but would also help you implement it in your own company. So what he'll do is lay out what your pain points are, lay out what those three areas should be, and you'll start to lay out proactively. Because right now at the Trusted Toolbox, I have the guy who runs the Home Service Institute, he delivers our customer service modules. My operations manager delivers the operational points, and then a combination of my technicians and my operations manager do the technical give back. And I just sit in the back now, and I'll just come up and punch up a few points at the end. So we'll do that, but we have the whole year laid out. In fact, that's why I was telling Brian from Simpson he can't make our deck training class. We're going to have a big deck training class next uh, May, uh, in two weeks. Yep. How many times a week do you have your whole team coming in for a company meeting? Is it just the one training? Or just the one training, and I only have uh, that one hour meeting happens just twice a month with all of my technicians, all of my project managers. The only people who are excused are office ladies. Um, just because they have families and we go back and we'll kick, kick them back later. But all of my sales guys are in there, all the project managers, and they're all hearing the same messages. Because even our estimators need to learn to know how to use some tools a little bit better. Guilty. But I only do it every two weeks. We tried to go weekly, and uh, I got that the cadence was too much. It felt like we were... Not everybody. Now I'll have sales meetings separately. I'll have remodeling meetings separately. Uh, and then I'll meet with our office staff and talk about some of these other things. Chris, when you talked about um, how the technicians want to make more money also, and that you, they don't want to sell, but because they're delivering a better experience now, those, those add-on sales have increased. Do you tie those together with your compensation? I do. So we have three, three areas where they can get compensated above and beyond the job. Uh, if they add on anything, they have an extra 10% of the labor. If they do so many dollars in labor in a month, they get an extra 2 to 3% bonus. And I also pay for reviews. All I'm doing is, and I'm not saying push the review, I'm saying ask for it. You get a good review, and I see it on Google, you get an extra 25 bucks. And those line up with my wants as an owner. My, my want is to have raving fans who show five-star reviews. My want is to have these guys sell a little bit more because I know when I get an add-on sale, this is a proof point, I have a happy customer. It's not a disgruntled customer who does the add-on, it's the happy customer who's doing that. And I want full-time employees, I want full-time guys. I actually, all my guys are employees. I use subcontractors in remodeling, but everybody comes into training every other week is are my employees. I do bring my subcontractors in once a year. I'm gonna start bringing them in more. So as far as your retention uh, transformation that you have with your employees, how much 
much of that can you attribute to them getting more compensation? I think the compensation is a big, obviously it's a big part of it. Um, because, but what I've seen too is when I first started this, I didn't put this up, my bonus structure that I have, that's labors per month, 25% of them would hit it. So that's one out of every four. And at the time I started training really after it, I was at 12. Today we're at 15 or 16. Right now 75% of them are hitting that goal. So they're making more money because they're buying into it because we're able to show them that if you just do this, call your customer, give them a plan, tell them what's going on and clean up after you're done and then ask for the review at the end of the job to show off your work, then you can do it. Because what I've also found too is what's happening, we're in that tipping industry. Our guys are getting tips. We just had a guy get a $200 tip on a four day job. And he asked me, he said, am I supposed to turn that in? I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, I appreciate you just even asking me, brother. That was awesome. Five minutes. So guys, I did, I've, I've attended one of uh, Chris's classes uh, last year and honestly it was one of the most scheduled and structured things and because of that, we're making an office in Bucket with a big training and you will be there, Chris. <laughs> so mark your calendar. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Call before you come. Yeah, just, well, just make sure I call or text before I come. If there's one thing you got for me is just call me. Call before you get there, man. Please. Yeah. I actually had to learn something. Uh, texting is now more important uh, than the call. So we actually do, uh, we, with our system, we text ahead now. But these guys are told to call and text. And it's all, they can do it out of our system. And I said, nah. And I was driving around going to do a sales call with uh, one of my oldest clients. He's 84. I called. No answer. I'm like, we're running way ahead of schedule for this estimate. The guy says, well, you should text him. I'm like, man, he's 84. <laughs> I text him and said, we're going to be on our way. This is Chris. I'll be on my way. I'm going to be there early. Can you see me? I got back NP. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, no age is in there, buddy. Yeah, stop, stop judging that book. He went NP on me. I'm like, I can't believe you just did that. I got a question for you. So like we're, yeah. we're actually doing a whole, like, uh, I want to say a crash training. Uh, we, we just launched the catalog, and our team is required to learn many vocabulary that's it's been very specific. Do you have any tips for our team how to get through this memorization and Stories is one. Um, I didn't talk about onboarding here. I just wanted to help people understand how you can implement training in your own company and do this and it doesn't happen overnight. But you're talking to me, I, I would uh, take that as onboarding. And what I'm finding through my, on, uh, my own onboarding today, if you haven't seen the studies, we're all gonna be hiring millennials. And if you are a millennial, it's okay. I don't think you're bad. You're not a bad person. Kind of. No, I'm kidding. But we all had the same thing. What they do tell you in the studies is that right now, millennials in that age group, which now is what, 30, 30 to 40? You're, You're turning 40. Right. 40. Right now, 50% of them are looking for a new job and 50% are planning on leaving that job. So 100% of them may be turning over the next year. It's a crazy stat. With our artists that we have, especially what we have, you got to think about that the same way and that you got a gig economy worker and they got to come in and we're using their knowledge and their brain and their skills and their ability to learn. We got to get them to be as quick as possible. But how do these people learn the best? They do not learn two plus two is four or go to the whiteboard or a chalkboard when I grew up and write, I will not shut up 500 times because Sister Mary Lutheran said I did something wrong. They learn through stories. They learn through videos, excuse me. They learn through touching and feeling and having dialogue. They will not learn by just sitting in front uh, listening to me drone on and on and on, which is a good thing because that's really tiring for me too. Yeah, two, minutes. two minutes? Two minutes. Or we could call it good. Or uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And then we'll be down there. We got a booth down uh, at lunch. Uh, if you guys come down and walk around, Jill's going to be manning our booth for us uh, today. And I've got my books on sale too if anybody wants to buy the book. Um, or you want to go out there and find the Safari podcast. Small Business Safari on all of your, fam your, your favorite uh, podcast listening things. All right, thanks. <laughs>